Lastly, past this iceberg can be pretty tucking out, but I'm ready to get back to part three, this time without making them back to back with no break, because this iceberg is as big as my list of dietary concerns. Also, someone suggested in the last one to put us on kind of warning because the topics that are going to be talked about might be a bit much for some people, which I didn't even consider, but they're absolutely right. So this is your warning. Uh, this video will be talking about some rather dark topics like disappearances, murders, and Elsa Gate. If you don't want to see any of that, then frankly, why did you click this iceberg of all things? You did this to yourself! Also, as you can tell, this layer and probably all the ones after uh, much bigger than the last two, and I'll be splitting them into halves, because as much as I love to make two hour long videos, they're not easy to do and they're fully edited and I need to maintain a schedule. Anyway, let's fucking go. Bobby Dunbar. Bobby Dunbar was an American boy known for his disappearance and return. At only four years old, Bobby Dunbar vanished on a fishing trip with his parents in August of 1912. Eight months later, Bobby Dunbar was found by authorities accompanying a piano repairman by the name of William Cantle Walters. Bobby went home to his family and lived to the age of 58 before dying in 1966. Or so it may seem, because what makes this case so weird is the circumstances. The boy that returned to his family and lived his life as Bobby Dunbar was not Bobby Dunbar, allegedly. For you see, when this boy was found, both William and a woman named Julia Anderson claimed this boy's actual name was Charles Bruce Anderson, Julia's son. However, various things took away from the certainty of Julia's claims. For instance, allegedly, according to newspapers, when Julia was taken and presented with five boys of similar age to her son, she couldn't identify which one was her own child immediately, which led to suspicion of her claims along with the questioning of her moral character as someone who had three kids, two of which were super dead, out of wedlock. Julia was unable to afford a long-term court battle, and the court determined that this boy was in fact Bobby Dunbar and also convicted William of kidnapping. After the trial, everyone would end up leading their own separate lives. Julia Anderson lived out her life in Poplarville, having married and having seven children. Reportedly, her children and their children have claimed that despite living happily, she commonly brought up her lost child, and they considered him kidnapped by the Dunbars. She also became a devout Christian, served as a nurse, and helped found a church in the area before passing in 1940. William Cantle Walters served two years in prison for kidnapping before successfully appealing and dying in 1945. The fake Bobby Dunbar, as I said, lived to the age of 58 and died in 1966, having married and had four children. In 2004, DNA testing confirmed that this so-called Bobby Dunbar had no blood relation to the Dunbar family, and it's believed that Julia was most likely the true parent of this man. The biggest question, of course, is what happened to the actual Bobby Dunbar. While declared dead in absentia, we have no idea what actually happened to the child. While rumors exist of sightings and footsteps, I think of a four-year-old vanishes in the wild, he probably died and will likely never find his remains because what do you think animals might do if they find a fresh corpse in the wild? But who knows, maybe we'll find something related to him one day, but this was a long time ago. And as a missing person's case, this is quite an unusual one. Everybody ended up having some kind of closure at the end too, which is very, very abnormal. The Dunbars thought they got their son back and died before learning otherwise. The Walters family were vindicated of their kidnapping after DNA came back conclusive as to the identity of the boy. And while Julia never got her son back, we did know that apparently she lived her life mostly happily with her children. This leaves us with primarily the tragedy of just the missing child himself, who frankly seems to go a bit underspoken compared to the Bobby Dunbar who actually lived. Joan Rish. Joan Carolyn Bard was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1930 and would live a rather unfortunate childhood. With her parents dying in a suspicious fire that is believed to have some manner of conspiracy to it and having alleged to have been sexually abused by her foster father. Despite this, she graduated from college, got a job, and married Martin Rish, and left her job to have a family with him. October 21st, 1961, Joan would disappear, after putting her two-year-old child David to bed and taking her four-year-old daughter Lillian to the neighbor's house to play with their son. Joan would only be confirmed to have been seen once more, when neighbor Barbara Barker claimed to have seen Joan in her driveway, wearing a trench coat with outstretched arms holding something red. Later that day, after Barbara took Lillian back to her house and left to go do something, she came back to find Lillian in distress at her house, claiming that Mommy is gone and the kitchen is covered in red paint. You'd be shocked to know this was not red paint, but rather blood. And I'm about to show an image of the kitchen which isn't going to show much and is all black and white, but it might be a bit much for some people possibly, so... Warning. This is a police report image of the kitchen at the time, smeared in the life juices of the human race. As you can tell, this place is all fucked up. There's a table tossed over, there's blood everywhere, this is a mess. At first, people believed Joan had committed self on alive, but if that was the case, there'd be a, a body in the house, and they ain't no body. Witnesses also claimed they saw her wandering around dazed, and additionally, multiple people, including the milkman who came to Joan's house, claimed to see an unknown car in her driveway that wasn't hers. Now, at the time, there were unidentifiable bloody fingerprints at the crime scene, 
but years later it was determined that these fingerprints were not Joan, meaning someone else was there on the day. Blood was also not just in the kitchen, but leading through the house, out the house, and past the car, but there were no bloody footprints. After this, all four suspects of note, the mailman, the milkman, the muffin man down Drury Lane, and Joan's husband were all clear to suspicion, and we don't know really what happened. There are a lot of theories, the first is that Joan staged her own disappearance, supported by how the blood that was found would not be enough to constitute a lethal wound, and that she had checked out books at a library related to murders and disappearances, including one that was very similar in situation to what happened to her. Though the biggest point against this theory is that there are fingerprints showing someone else was there on the day. The second theory is that Joan was having an affair and had a fight with the man, explaining the unknown card, the other fingerprints, and a few beer bottles of a present that did not belong to her husband. Other theories include her having an amnesia attack, her having actually been murdered or kidnapped, or... Uh... She tried to give herself an abortion with an abortionist, which was illegal. It would explain a lot of the weirdness and blood down her leg, but I don't know if I want to keep talking about this because I have no idea if YouTube is okay with me saying that. But the idea is that it was botched and that's why she was bleeding, holding her stomach and disoriented, and then the person with her took her in the two-tone car and dumped her or something. Who knows? Not us, we still have no idea. The Trump Family In 2016, Australian couple Mark and Jacob at Trump went on a family trip with their family. They vanished, but that's not where the story ends because they were all found. The story starts in August where the family began their journey from the state of Victoria to the state of New South Wales. One of their sons, Mitchell, promptly launches his phone out the car window 32 kilometers in, the phone flies to Spain and knocks someone out. The day after, Mitchell then leaves the journey in the town of Bathurst and starts walking back home. Sometime after that, the rest of the family stop off somewhere, where the daughters steal a fucking car and drive to Goldburn. And then they go their separate ways, one driving further and the other found stowing away in the back of a stranger's van. The latter daughter, Rihanna, was found in reportedly a catatonic state, unable to answer questions and needed to be taken to a hospital. The other daughter, Ella, just promptly drove back home, with Mitchell having followed soon after having taken a train. Meanwhile, the parents Jacoba and Mark were also separated, Jacoba continuing on her journey to nowhere in particular, while Mark was found tailgating people creepily on the road, and then chasing after them after they pulled over. Jacoba was later found in hospital, and Mark was found by police just wandering around. The question is, why the fuck did any of this happen? And frankly, nobody knows, not even the family themselves. All we know is that mental illness was definitely involved. Today, it seems like the family have kept a low profile and maintain a close relationship, and they seem quite happy. So all I have to say is, Tamam Should. Tamam Should is a stupid name to refer to this case by because a Google search takes you to an Australian progressive surf rock band. What this actually refers to is an Australian corpse that washed up one day in 1948, more commonly known by the Summerton Man. This is one of the most well-known and profound mysteries in Australian history. As the story goes, in Summerton Park, Adelaide on the 1st of December in that year, a body was reported found on a bench. He was found only with an unlit cigarette in his collar, an unused rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a bus ticket, a half handy pack of Juicy Fruits, and a few other unimportant things. A ton of witnesses came forward, all claiming to have seen the body, with most of them saying that for a while they thought it was just a weird guy who didn't move or was unconscious, aside from one guy who said that he raised an arm and then dropped it. Nobody was able to determine who the man was, how he died, or even when he died, only knowing that he ate some pastry a few hours before his death, and it was likely not a natural death. For the first time in ever, the police had to embalm a corpse. Now you're probably wondering what this has to do with Tamam Should. Well, in the man's pocket, which was sewn up suspiciously, was a roll of paper that read Tamam Should, a Persian phrase meaning ending or finished. This was torn from a copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, an English translation of a selection of stanzas written by Omar Khayyam made by Edward Fitzgerald. This copy of the book was found by a man who went by the pseudonym of Ronald Francis. Due to the theme of the book being about living life to the fullest and having no regrets, some believe this man may have offed himself as a result. Another layer of oddness comes with this version of the book that had a piece torn, as it had these undeciphered scribbles on the back of it, and to this day we have not decoded these words. I would recommend if you're interested to look into this case yourself, because there's simply so much stuff that I don't know what to include and what to leave out. I've brought up the basics and you can go on from there. Oh, also, some guy named Derek in 2022 apparently found with DNA analysis that the man is named Carl Webb, but so far I found no confirmation as to the validity of this, so I don't want to spread it around as fact before we know for sure. Could be false, could just be wrong. Who knows? Hisashi Ouchi. Hisashi Ouchi was born in 1965 and worked at a nuclear power plant. This plant converted uranium between forms for nuclear energy purposes, with slow and careful processes. One day, after officials had tried experimenting on skipping steps to speed up the progress of this conversion, and thus missing their deadline ironically, Hisashi and his peers decided to take a shortcut. These people had no idea what they were doing, and guess what happened? 
Yeah, something akin to that. A big fucking explosion that doused them with radiation. So a cyvert, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, is a measurement used to represent the health risks of ionizing radiation. More than seven cyverts is considered fatal. Now three people were there. Supervisor Yutaka Yokokawa was hit with three cyverts of radiation. Masato Shinohara was exposed to 10, but his Sashi Ouchi was exposed to 17, more than twice the amount that is considered lethal, making him the most radioactive man in known human history. His body was covered in burns, and his eyes were bleeding by the time he got to the hospital. The effects of the radiation stripped him of his white blood cells and left him without an immune system whatsoever. Despite apparently wanting to die according to some sources, for 83 days Hisashi was kept alive and apparently used as something of a guinea pig to test stem cell treatments, skin grafting, and so on. He had three heart attacks in a single hour and was brought back every time, with each occurrence of a heart attack destroying more DNA and brain cells. Eventually he died of multiple organ failure. This is kind of a horrific story to think about, just imagine being in his condition for several months. The moral of the story is, don't mess around with radiation if you don't know what you're doing, but I think most people would know that. Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds are thunder turds, big fucking flappy dappy flying through the sky is such a pest they punch the best. So yeah, thunderbirds are figures of Native American folklore and culture, representing power and strength. It's said that thunder is a result of their wings flapping and lightning is a result of their eyes flashing, though these vary between different tribe beliefs. In modern day, thunderbirds have also been treated as cryptids, as in the name thunderbird doesn't just refer to the tribal belief of a giant bird that has supernatural abilities, but it's just sort of a term thrown around to refer to cryptids that are just giant birds. Here's footage of a thunderbird. Month of July, 1977, many reports of giant living thunderbirds were pouring into newspaper offices and TV stations across central Illinois. Yeah, and yeah, as you can tell, this is a bird. Nagoro. Nagoro is a village covered in fucking dolls. Like, just so many dolls. The place is in Japan, and was once housing 300 inhabitants, but the decline in Japan's population was left it with only 27 by the time of 2019. Essentially, in the 2000s, a child named Tsukimi Ayano made a doll of her dad, and then just kept making dolls, and you can fucking go there if you want. Devil's Tramping Ground A camping ground of legends and local lore, with stories of dogs not wanting to go near it, things going missing, and strange things happening to people who camp there. It's also a 12 meter ring that apparently nothing can grow in because a devil walks around there thinking of evil things to do. Which just makes me picture this guy stomping around trying to figure out how to smash some porcelain. Aircraft Boneyard an aircraft boneyard just refers to a location that's used to house aircraft that are retired. Really nothing other than that, if a plane isn't in use anymore, it's either destroyed or it's in one of these places. Jack Stauber. Uh, 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 Agamemnon Counterpart. Agamemnon Counterpart is a stupid video with a stupid premise. Nothing describes how stupid it is more than this. In the year 2571, a video cassette tape was found in a pile of rubble on the ruins of a certain blue planet. What you are about to witness will not be the contents of the aforementioned tape. This is an entirely different recording. Now isn't that just so fucking helpful? And then just a bunch of nonsense happens with a ton of screaming and shit. That's it. There's a creepypasta that says the screams are from a Japanese rape because stay classy creepypasta writers. So what the fuck is this video? Fucking, it's part of the Destination Imagination 2001 competition made by Jason Kovic and his team for it. The star may as well be, Hey, so one day people found a super scary tape from some shithole down in Linden Park. Anyway, this is, uh, this has nothing to do with that. Who cares? Crackmaster. Crackmaster is the cosmic overlord of all asses. It's also a lost Sesame Street short that was later found. It's a story about a girl in her house making friends with the crack creatures, which are not related to drugs. They're related to cracks in the wall. Late 2008, people started to talk about it on the internet because it vanished, and Sesame Street didn't want to acknowledge it, probably because of the whole crack cocaine thing. But then it was found, so yeah. Lake City Quiet Pills. Oh boy, I don't know, what do I say about this one? So, Reddit. This post. This post talks about a guy called Milo, who was moderator of r slash jailbait, which I am now paying to know is a subreddit that exists. He's also the owner of LakeCityQuietPills.com. What are Lake City Quiet Pills? Assassinations. I'm not joking, and now I don't want to say any more because I don't want to disappear one day. Anguished man painting. He does look pretty fucking anguished. So one day a man named Sean Robinson sends in a story to Your True Tales. He says that his grandma had this painting for 25 years and said that it was evil and that she used to see dark figures of a man, the sounds of crying, 
and said that the artist whacked himself after finishing it. One time, Sean recorded the painting for three days straight and recorded it falling over, and after it falls, you can see some weird wispy smoke stuff almost behind it. Two years later, more investigation would go about, but either way, I don't know how that investigation went down, I couldn't find anything. The painting's definitely kind of unnerving though, and he, he's certainly a bit anguished. The upsweep sound. August of 1991, Noah pick up this sound ring through the entire Pacific Ocean. Holy fuck, that would make for great ambience in a video. To this day, it's not known exactly what this sound is, but it is known to be seasonal, peaking in spring and autumn, and it's hypothesized to be underwater volcano activity. Then again, it could just be an alien that's living underwater and constantly stubbing its toe. The Julia sound. 1999, 1st of March, this was picked up by Noah and it ran for two minutes. Here it is sped up 16 times. This sound is massive, but also was just an iceberg that had run off Antarctica. The Man from Torred. John Allen Kucher Zagreus is an alleged man who was detained in the 1960s in Japan for alleged document fabrication. Allegedly, he was arrested for suspected identity fraud. He claimed to be an ambassador of Negus Habus with diplomatic immunity, so it probably looks something like this. He was apparently also an American spy and had a large magazine-sized passport that was written in Negus Habanesian. Stamped by multiple embassies, though it was believed to have been faked anyway. According to Zagreus, he was born in the US and moved through the UK, Czechoslovakia, and Germany. He was a pilot of the Royal Air Force during World War II and was once captured by the Germans. He became an American spy and then diplomat in Negus Habus, a country lying close to Ethiopia. Zagreus was sentenced to one year in prison and attempted to commit self-death with a piece of glass. After his release, he was deported to Hong Kong. If that doesn't sound quite like the story you know, that's because I just told you about the supposed true story written in the memoirs of TMPD Police Security Bureau investigator Atsuyuki Sasa. At the time, the mystery man was a big part of Japanese news. On August 15th of that year, an issue of British tabloid The Province reported this story with some alterations, into the version we know about today, with Negus Habus replaced with Tored, believed now to be a misspelling of Toreg, referring to the people who lived in the Sahara. The modern version of the story is that the man was from Torrid and had a Torrid passport, which he pointed as being located in what we know as Andorra. He was placed in a hotel with guards for investigation, but vanished by the time of the following morning, leading to many mysteries about if he was from an alternate dimension or if he ever even existed. Well, he probably did exist, and he was just a guy who committed identity fraud. With that said, I still really like the story of the man from Torrid, and I consider it kind of an interesting urban legend. The Green Children of Woolpit this is a legend about two kids with green skin found in a cave in the 12th century English village Woolpit. Apparently they spoke an unknown language, they ate only broad beans, and they slowly began to learn to eat other foods, making their skin color change, with the boy dying and the sister being baptized. Story goes she learned English and said she came from a land where the sun didn't shine and everything was green. So the question is, did this actually happen? No, the man in the iron mask. The fellow in the velvet face holder was a yet unknown prisoner of state incarcerated for 34 years until he died. He was known for having worn a velvet mask and likely having been a figure of pretty big importance to have been kept alive and not executed. Official documents have actually revealed that he didn't always wear the mask and only wore it when traveling between prisons and during his final years. His identity is the main point of mystery. Who the hell was he? The most popular theory I could find was one proposed by Voltaire, that he was the illegitimate older brother of the Sun King himself, Louis XIV. Others include being Louis' father, French general Vivienne de Bolonde, or the son of Charles II. We still don't know to this day, and official records don't tell us. Personally, I just know him as the guy on Quiet Riot's mental health. Christine Collins. Christine Collins is not a woman who disappeared. She is a woman whose son disappeared. Much better. March 10th, 1928, she gives her nine-year-old son Walter money to go to the cinema, and he never comes back. Five months of searching later, a boy claims to be Walter, and Collins pays to bring him over to her. However, she realizes soon, this boy is not a son at all. This is where the story gets fucked up. Instead of actually listening to her, LAPD apparently just told her to take him anyway and try him out, which is fucked. She did this, but it didn't really work because it wasn't her kid. She took dental records of her son to the police to prove he wasn't her kid, and instead of listening to her and looking bad, Captain JJ Jones instead decided to send her to a psychiatric ward and kept her for 10 days. Until the boy came out and admitted he had lied about his identity, he was actually Arthur Hutchins Jr., who was trying to get away from his family. 
After some time, LAPD thought they pulled up a lead that Walter was victim of a Canadian serial killer, baby fucker, and kidnapper who confessed to nine murders, but not Walter's. That serial killer's dead, which is good because his face is genuinely terrifying. Christine never believed this and kept looking for her son until the day she died at the age of 75. The only way to make the tragedy of a woman who lost her son and spent the rest of her life looking for him to no success more tragic than it already is, is the knowledge that LAPD tried to make her just suck it up and live with a fake son. Jesus Christ. Megumi Yakoda. Megumi Yakoda was a 13-year-old Japanese girl who was kidnapped by a North Korean agent in 1977. She was at least one of 17 who were kidnapped by North Korea between the late 1970s and early 1980s. North Korea have admitted to kidnapping her and have claimed that she has died in captivity, but her family believe that she is alive and have waged public campaigns to get her back. In 1986, Megumi would marry a South Korean by the name of Kim Yong-nam, who was also kidnapped, and had a daughter in 1987, Kim Eun-yong, which is a name I've definitely pronounced right. According to Yong-nam, Megumi committed dead, and I'm struggling to find more ways to say that without the word YouTube doesn't like. They sent her cremated remains to her family, however, people believe this is untrue. Her family believes that the husband was reading off a script or limited some other way by the North Korean government to say what he said, and it's widely believed that Megumi is still alive to this day, but we don't know where. Maybe she's dead, maybe she's alive, I don't know. Um, I'm not going to put a North Korean target on my back by trying to push it a certain way. But Megumi's family have met their granddaughter in 2014 in Mongolia. We don't know what's up with Megumi herself though. The Springfield 3. This refers to a missing persons case that is unsolved and involving three people. June 7, 1992, Springfield, Missouri, Susanna Streeter, Stacey McCall and Cheryl Levitt disappeared from Levitt's home and were never found again. Last thing at 2am leaving the last of the graduation parties they had gone to that day and spotted many around in places throughout that morning, their friend Janelle Kirby went to their house later on that day and found the door unlocked with nobody inside. All their belongings were still there, their cars were still in the driveway, and there's no evidence of a struggle other than a broken porch light. At that point, Kirby also got two calls from an identified male making sexual innuendos. Again, terrifying to be a woman. There was also a tape on an answering machine that was of interest, but some idiot accidentally erased it. We don't know what happened, we don't have suspects other than a convicted kidnapper who has an alibi, and we're just confused. Mr. Cruel. This one is just fucked up. Fucked up! And if you want to skip it, I don't blame you. It's also right here where I live, in Australia. Late 1980s and early 1990s, a yet unidentified man in a black parlor club had broke into a family's home, bound and gagged the parents, and threw them into a wardrobe. He tied their nine-year-old boy to his own bed, and then... Uh, he forced himself onto their 11-year-old daughter for two hours, then cooked himself up a meal and left. He did not leave a single trace of his existence, no evidence whatsoever, and he was always well covered. In 1988, the following year in December, he targeted another family. He bound and gagged the parents, cut the phone lines, and kidnapped their 10-year-old daughter, Sharon. 18 hours later, he released her at Bayswater High School. You can imagine he didn't exactly uh, kidnap her and put her back without doing anything. But she claimed that he was actually really nice and that he was like, he cooked her food and like, took care of her. That's not creepy. And at last, in 1990, he did it again. This time abducting a 13-year-old girl, Nicola, and abusing and molesting her for 50 hours. Before dropping her off and throwing her aside. Other crimes have also been believed to be associated with Mr. Cruel, though they have not been confirmed. Including the murder of 13-year-old Cameron Chan and the abduction of a 14-year-old girl in 1985. We don't know who he is, but there is a special place in hell for him. Agent 355. Agent 355 was an unknown woman who did spy work for George Washington in 1776. A member of the Culper Ring, she is believed to have done many remarkable things, primarily being the spearhead of uncovering the treachery of Benedict Arnold. However, we're not exactly sure who she was, or even if she existed at all. She's only ever referred to once directly in a letter from Abraham Woodland that read, I intend to visit 727 before long, and think by the assistance of a 355 of my acquaintance, shall be able to outwit them all. And it's known that he was accompanied by a woman on this journey. However, it's also believed that a 355 could just mean a woman, but who knows. One report claims she was captured by the British and died in a prison ship, but as with her entire existence, this may not be true. Miss Shea St. John. Shay St. John is a supermodel who was disfigured in a train accident and fixed her body with mannequin parts. At least that's her character, because Shay St. John's is the character made by Eric Fournier, who unfortunately passed in 2010. Some people think that Shay St. John is really funny, some people think it's really creepy, and some people want to fuck her. 
Alan Tutorial. Alan Tutorial is a surrealist horror comedy series made as an art project by Alan Resnick, who plays a fictionalized version of himself in the series. The series follows Alan, an ambiguously mentally ill person who makes videos and tutorials, and slowly things get creepy and crazy. If you want to know how deep the rabbit hole of this series goes, this is an hour long video explaining it, which... Jesus Christ. I've seen Alan's tutorial, I barely understand it. Maybe I need to pay more attention and watch it again. That's always possible. I am pretty dumb. Local 58. Local 58 is an analog horror series from 2015, known for its presentation as if each video was an archive recording of a television channel from West Virginia called Local 58 from the 1930s all the way till now. Over the course of the series, the channel gets hijacked multiple times, displays unusual broadcasts, and has a lot of strange stuff in general involving the Thought Research Initiative. Unlike some of these other series, Local 58 actually only has 9 episodes, so I can probably give you a rundown on each one. If you want to check out Local 58, which I would recommend because it's quite creepy, and each episode is only like 3 minutes long, skip to the next entry to avoid spoilers. The first episode is Weather Service, and it seems to be a battle between network hijackers and the network, with the hijackers trying to convince people to look at the moon while the network tries to stop them, and it ends with a bunch of cryptic messages followed by a shot of the moon with people screaming in the background. Following that is Contingency, which I actually think is the most well-known entry, because I've seen people talking about this one as if it was real without knowing what Local 58 is. Like, it's crazy. People have, like, thought this was an actual hoax that happened. Contingency is a station sign-up that gets interrupted with an emergency alert saying that America has lost and been taken over by a foreign nation. But the citizens shouldn't worry. It should preserve their spirit and the freedom of the American spirit by euthanizing their children and dogs and then committing self cadaveration then just a, oops, hoax. Obviously this creeped a lot of people out because you know if this was a real broadcast that some people would probably actually do this. Though on the hoax screen you can read in the background if you look closely that it says to say this was a hoax in the case of an accidental broadcast, meaning that this is likely intended to be what would be broadcast if this event occurred. You are on the fastest available route follows a broadcast being interrupted, that's the trend here, but footage of someone driving into the middle of nowhere and suddenly hearing a roar and seeing this fucking thing, then driving away frantically and... dying. Station ID is just a trailer with some cryptic messages. Show for children starts with this guy who creeps me out even as someone who isn't afraid of clowns, except for this one, and gives us a rubber hose cartoon of a skeleton boy named Kadavre walking through a graveyard and coming across three open greys. In the first he thinks he'll find his love, and instead sees this wonderful fellow, and he freaks out. Second, he sees this lovely thing, and the third one, he falls down, with each grave causing the animation to take a quieter and less cheerful tone. Then he reaches a fourth open grave, but this time, he's the bottom of it. A giant realistic moon looms over, and Kadavre seemingly dies as a result, becoming a pile of real-life bones lying on the floor. Then this clown's eyes start moving! A look back is both a thank you video to the fans of the show, and also a look back at previous episodes and things, with the message that Local 58 is used as a medium by someone to send their own programs. Real Sleep is the longest episode and plays as a personalized tape made by the Thor Research Initiative for you specifically. Starting with a myth or fact game that gets you accustomed to the idea that dreams are bad. It brings up a Kleitman map that says it can help mess with your brain in relation to dreaming, followed by these lovely faces personalized for you flashing on screen, along with the phrase, there are no faces. This is followed by a set of phrases flashing almost too quick to read, including the lovely phrases, they are not faces, and your home has another door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> before thanking you for being such a good sport because now you're free of dreams. Also, don't see a doctor. Skywatching interrupts a broadcast of Skywatching to show a home video of a person recording Orion's belt and Pilates, before stopping to record the moon, which is labelled as his throne, implying something, possibly the one sending messages through Local 58, lives on the moon. They zoom in on the moon showing an organic structure, looking like it's a living, breathing organism with natural constructs all over its body, including this one before the moon vanishes and explodes back on screen much larger in the sky. And the person recording walks in front, prostrates themselves to the moon, and the, then dies. All the while the lower half of the moon is cracked open, or it's growing weird, or something's going on, and this is visibly there. And then it cuts off. This might be my favorite entry of the series, it's this or Contingency. Currently the final part is Digital Transition, where the broadcasting station makes a switch from analog to digital in 2021 only for it to get distorted and for whatever entity is behind all this to fully take over the digital broadcast just as they did the analog one, with a poem in the background as well, and orders to go outside again to the first episode. This also leads to a website, which itself has its own share of things to do, but I'd be here all day if I went into that. I really like Local 58, it's a cool series and I recommend it. There are plenty of theories I could go into, like what the moon is, is it an egg for this creature, is it something like vaguely related to this one from that show for children episode? 
Who knows? Maybe this whole thing is an alien invasion or an Eldritch Monster's machinations. But I'm sure you'd be better off finding dedicated videos of that instead of my ramblings in an iceberg. Pet Scott. Pet Scott is another one of those horror series. Here being on the guise of being a Let's Play series of an unreleased game called Pet Scott that our protagonist Paul has a copy of. Supposedly this is some long lost PlayStation game and goes by normally until shit goes wild. Going from a content lacking game where the protagonist captures pets with puzzles to shit related to one specific guy who did horrible stuff. Really, I can't go into much depth for this one in a short time frame, because unlike Logan 58, it's got more than 9 episodes, but I recommend checking it out yourself. Elsagate. I'm going to jam my own testicles into a fucking blender. Elsagate was a controversy wherein videos of mostly Elsa and other child-friendly characters were labeled as child-friendly videos and put on YouTube Kids. Despite the fact that the contents of the videos involve blood, gore, sexual activity, drugs, alcohol, and fetish stuff, be glad I'm not showing you anything on screen related to it right now. It was bad. M Cave. The MK mystery starts with a video called Son of an Area 51 Technician, which had this comment by a user called Snakebit McGee, describing a K shaped like a perfect capital M that made his body vibrate when he got closer and closer, until he just ran away. A few months later, after promising to, Kenny Veach, the man behind it all, went on another hike to look for this cave. In a 21 minute video, he showed off his hike, but he couldn't find the cave. Well, I did not find the cave. That is so weird. I mean, I thought for sure I was just going to be able to find it. Um, I remember it being fairly easy. Uh, who knows, but... After this, Kenny would make another go to find the cave, but never returned. A month after, his girlfriend made a comment on his last video, and this is basically the last information we got on the matter. He never returned, they found his phone and car, she believes he committed self-whacking. Other theories around there include that he died of natural causes, or that he was silenced by the government. To me, I think the self-dead one is probably the most believable, but... Kenny also was known to be pretty unsafe with his hike, so the first one's also possible. Unfortunately, this is all the knowledge we have on Kenny Veach and the M-Cave. Neither have ever been found and remain a mystery. Kenny Veach. I literally just fucking- The Great Molasses Flood. Let's go back to 1919 Boston, Massachusetts. A 15 meter tall, 27 meter wide tank of nearly 9 million liters of molasses decided that it just had enough of working and that it should explode today. Likely as a result of thermal expansion created when the colder molasses in the tank was exposed to hot molasses tipped in from a ship. The flood, well, flooded Boston with molasses. Witnesses recall hearing thunder crack like booms and the earth shaking, and machine gun like rivet sounds. As a result, 150 people were injured and 21 people were killed, and a ton of property was damaged. The main mystery, I imagine, is why the flood happened. As I said, the reason I gave there was a likely reason, but others have been proposed. The one I said is just the one that I could find that was most agreed upon. So yeah, the Great Molasses Flood was indeed a flood of molasses that was pretty great. I make it sound like the deaths of 20 people was a great thing. Wait a minute. The Collar Bank Bomb Heist. I had to watch a BuzzFeed video for this one. The things I do for you guys. The story of this one can be summed up as such. We start at August 28, 2003. Brian Wells delivers a pizza order from his workplace to a few miles further out. Two hours later, Wells was caught trying to rob a bank. He claimed that three black men had forced him to wear a collar bomb and rob the bank. Not long after that, the bomb exploded around his neck. You can fucking guess what happened to him. Now, this whole situation is very weird for a number of reasons. We don't know all the conspirators related to this case, at least last I checked, everywhere says there could be more, and the whole situation with Wells is in general weird. From what we know, he was heard talking about this whole plot to rob the bank days before it happened and was killed to lower the number of witnesses. However, his family disputes this, claiming that he was accosted at gunpoint and forced into it. This is where we have two conflicting narratives depending on who you ask. Either Wells wore the bomb collar believing it to be fake so he could have an alibi if he was caught, and then learned it was real and began to freak out, or Wells was forced into it like he claimed after delivering the pizzas. When Wells' corpse was searched, he was also found with lengthy instructions, including a scavenger hunt warning that he was under surveillance and any contact with authorities would get him killed. He only completed one of the nine tasks before being captured and killed by the bomb. Police did not attempt to remove the collar and the bomb squad was too late to the scene. After these events, two more people were killed. Wells' co-worker and fellow delivery man Robert Pinetti and James Roden, who lived with a woman named Deal Armstrong, who also claimed that a man named William Rothstein was the mastermind of the plot and that Wells was directly involved. As it all turns out, this whole plan to rob the bank was made so the Deal could pay a man named Kenneth Barnes to kill her father Harold so she could get the inheritance money and... Whew. It's a wild case with a ton of twists and turns and just, wow. There are still holes in this. The big one is like, what exactly was Wells' role in it? Because whether he was a conspirator or forced into it depends on who you ask. So, yeah. The Little Albert Experiment. I didn't recognize this one until I read the alternate name, The Baby Albert Experiment. And then it all flooded back from psych class. 
This was a psychological experiment that was done on a nine month old baby. This experiment was done by John B. Watson, who hypothesized that the fear response children had to loud noises was not a conditioned one, but an innate one. He wanted to use classical conditioning, the Pavlovian process by which, for instance, a dog will begin to salivate in response to the sound of a bell, because they've come to associate the bell sound with food being given to them, to induce a phobia into a mentally stable child. Yes, they wanted to give a kid a phobia. At first, Albert was shown having no response to various stimuli, but after pairing a white rabbit with the sound of loud bang whenever Albert touched it, Albert was not only afraid and distressed towards the rat, but also any furry objects for a while. Over time it died down, but Albert was reconditioned as a result, with more banging that continued to distress him. There's a lot wrong with this. Obviously, ethically speaking, experimenting on a child not even a year old is fucking wrong. But also, Albert's mother withdrew him suddenly in the middle of the experiment, which was bad not just for the experiment, but also for Albert himself. Not only was the study incomplete and thus useless, but also Albert was never reconditioned into not having a fear response. As a result, Albert's last known conditioning was one of fear, and he was left without the chance to have the damage undone. The experiment also was generally shaky, with no control group and only one test subject. To add on to it, we have no idea who Albert is. Albert was just a pseudonym. There are some people believed to be Albert, primarily two, but both have since passed. One at the age of 6 and one at the age of 87 in 2007. So this was a disgusting experiment on a child we don't know that poorly followed the scientific method and offered inconclusive and unfinished results. Bronze Age Collapse During the 12th century, the Bronze Age of humanity, particularly in the Mediterranean and Near East, would suffer a major societal collapse that suddenly and violently disrupted the Bronze Age civilizations and brought economical decline and the Greek Dark Ages. Despite this extremely major event, we don't actually know for sure why it occurred, and have only got theories to go off of, and only Mesopotamia and Egypt came out surviving the collapse. Possible causes proposed include volcanic activity, a now extinct strain of bubonic plague, changes in how warfare was done, a major drought, the slow spread of ironworking technology, or just generally a collapse in society due to the increased complexity of sustainable life at the time. We may never know though. The North Hollywood Shootout on the 28th of February 1987, two heavily armed bank robbers, Larry Phillips Jr. and Emil This Last Name, engaged in an altercation with the LAPD in North Hollywood, resulting in both of their deaths and the injuring of 12 police officers and 8 civilians. Larry would be found dead on an adjacent street due to a self-inflicted gunshot wound, and Emil would be incapacitated and bleed to death before paramedics could arrive. This case is considered one of the largest, most intense gun battles in US police history, with an estimated 2,000 rounds fired between the parties. Yeah. Bucks Howden and Chase Vault's moving coffin. In 1808, a dead infant was buried in a vault with a heavy marble slab over the top. Four years later, when the crypt was reopened to bury another family member, they found the two coffins inside were moved. They were fixed and re-cemented over with the new coffin. In 1816 and 1819, the same thing would occur with the coffins having been shifted from their original positions. It was never determined how this occurred, and the coffins were moved to a new crypt eight months after the 1819 opening. That was the Chase family. The Bucks Howden family was a different but similar case in 1844 where a bunch of coffins moved around with no known cause. Blood falls. Oh yeah, when you get cut or bleed and gravity makes the blood descend, that means blood falls. This also refers to this iron oxidized salt water that splooges out of this fissure sometimes. The Pollock Twins. I can't read this as anything other than the Bollock Twins. Anyway, the Pollock Twins were two girls who died, then their parents had another pair of twins. 11-year-old Joanna and 6-year-old Jacqueline died in an accident in 1957 via car body slam. But then 9 months later, twins Jillian and Jennifer were born, and exhibited strange behaviour, and exhibited strange knowledge. At the age of 2, they asked for toys that they should not have known about, that belonged to their dead older siblings, even giving the dolls the same names their dead siblings had years ago. It only got weirder when they were then returned to their previous family home, where they seemed to recognize the old house they never saw, the old amusement park they never went to, and recognize neighbors they never met. They were even studied by a psychologist who studied reincarnation, and determined to be reincarnations of their dead siblings, but they lost their memories at the age of six. Are they reincarnations or not? I'll let you decide. Long Island Serial Killer Predictably, this refers to a serial killer who murdered people on Long Island, who has yet to be identified. He killed 10 to 16 people between 1996 and 2010, most of which were sex workers from Craigslist. These victims include the Gilgo Four fan in 2010, two that were found in March 2011, and four more who were found after that but have never been identified, including a 16 to 24 month old baby skeleton. To top all of this off, the investigation that found all these corpses was in search of a woman named Shannon Gilbert, whose corpse was also found. The identity of the killer is as of today not known. There are suspects, including convicted murderer John Bitrolf, police chief James Burke, and Peter Hackett, but they don't know. Violet Jessup. Miss Unsinkable was the nickname given to Violet Jessup, who survived the sinking of the Titanic 
and its sister ships, the Olympic and the Britannic, and survived to the age of 83 before she passed. That's all. Hans Nilsson Langseth. This man has a long ass beard. It's five meters long. He would have done a kick ass Ramu cosplay if he were alive today. Mirin Dajo. Arnold Gerrit Henskis, who went. Ar Arnold Gerrit. Arnold. Arnold Garrett Henskis, who went by the stage name of Mirren Dajo, was famous for impaling himself repeatedly with swords. Claiming that he had supernatural dreams and powers, he spent his life being famous for getting turned into a thousand-faced Hassan. He ran around being impaled, had water passed through tubes that impaled him, just got impaled. I'm showing you a lot of footage of him, but not the footage of him actually being stabbed, because I don't think YouTube will like that much. Also, he never bled when this was happening. So you must be wondering, how did he die? Well, voices told him to eat a needle and he died of aortic rupture as a result. Good job, man. Jeff the Killer original image. So if you've ever made a friend in your life, you probably don't know who Jeff the Killer is, but essentially, he is a character from a story on the internet of the same name that feels like it was written by a five-year-old, proofread by a four-year-old, edited by a six-year-old, and conceived by a three-year-old. The story is golden and absolutely worth reading. But anyway, this lovely motherfucker's image is the big cause of a mystery, because where did this come from? You might think this was just created by the person who made the creepypasta, but no. Oh, no, 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 it's not that simple. This creepypasta originated in 2011, and even before that was shared in this post on Newgrounds in 2008 by Sessa. The first story of this image is that a girl named Katie Robertson posted a photo of herself on 4chan, and was bullied as a result by users editing her face into the Jeff image, pushing Katie to self-go to sleep. But there's never been any evidence to support this, and a video from Gage, which I could not find myself, found that this woman is actually named Heather White, who was last found logging into a dating site years after she supposedly went the way of the dinosaurs. Sessa even said in an interview with Scare Theater, Apparently the picture is a photoshopped version of a girl named Katie Robinson who was bullied and eventually killed herself. Do you know about this? If so, do you have anything to say about this? I know all too well about this little inconvenience of a rumor, and I can assure everyone when I say that the rumors are completely bogus. I have no idea who came up with this rumor. It's most likely a troll seeing as the person who got the information on the Katie Robinson rumor was a 4chan regular, and they're not exactly someone to take serious at all. The picture was made using a white latex mask and some big plastic eyes with red rubber substance that simulated blinking. There was also a black ring around the eyes that were covering the exposed red eyelid. After it was made, two or three pictures were taken and posted. The rest is history. There's been some controversy over the picture. However, as it turns out, he's a fucking liar, because we've seen the image from years before Sessa ever made the story on a 2007 Japanese video and a 2005 Japanese message board, and this version even predates it, which... Okay, then there's this image, which is like an unedited version of Jeff, apparently, associated with this video we can't find of a woman pressing her face into a camera until she looks all white. We still don't know all the details, but let it be known, the story of the image is actually better and more interesting than the actual story itself. What is the afterlife? Well, you can't just leave me hanging, what's the fucking answer, Iceberg? Gary Hoy. You ever heard that story about the guy who threw himself at windows trying to prove they were super strong, and then one day he hit one and it flew out the window frame and he fell to his death out of skyscraper? That's this guy, June and Jennifer Gibbons. These two are none other than a pair of 1963 twins who spoke a language that only they could understand and never talked to anyone else. These two would go on to write books, talk to their third sister, and commit arson and theft, and then one died at the age of 29. John Lang. John Lang is a case of a man who believed that he was targeted by the Fresno police and had a lot of paranoid ideas about what he saw from the security cameras around his house. This security footage often shown pretty benign stuff like cars passing by or people walking their dog that he correlated into something suspicious. What was kind of suspicious though was when a car pulled up and pointed a camera at his house, but there are people who think this could have been a Google Earth thing or maybe people who didn't have a license to record that house and did it for like amateur filmmakers who flew by and shot the house and left, not with a gun. The story got crazy when Lang claimed Fresno police were going to kill him, and the next day he was found dead with his house on fire and like 50 knife wounds in his chest, though people seem to claim he was stabbed in the back despite the coroner's report saying otherwise. The mysterious circumstances of his death and the surveillance footage have gone quite a lot of people speculating as to whether he really was under fire and silenced by the police or not. But me personally, I think the footage and the circumstances of the death point to him having had some manner of paranoid schizophrenia and having self-immolated. Like, the firefighters couldn't get into his house without an axe, and his last recorded footage was apparently him brandishing a knife. Maybe the one he was stabbed with. Who knows, though. ONA. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name, I'm sure I am. ONA was a South Korean model and actress who ended her own life at the age of 36. Normally this would just be a generally tragic thing, but she also had a following on the internet, and people started noticing a bunch of strange things in her uploads. Because of course they did. 
For instance, 46 seconds into a last video... Oh wait, hold on. First off, I've heard people say that they've gotten ill or had seizures from this footage, so if flashing images are something that can affect you, I'd skip this part. So this is what played. This goes on for about a minute and was kind of just unsettling due to being her last video. The real conspiracy comes from the numbers 46 and 48. Her last video was numbered as 48, despite the fact that it was actually 46. In the glitching, it starts at the 46 second mark and ends 1 minute and 46 seconds in. The clock in the background points to both 8 and 6, but because the image is reversed, it looks like it's actually pointing at 4 and 6. In the video before this one, there's a 4 and 8 repeating subtitle string as well, and some people claim that she died 48 hours after her last video. All this stuff seems almost like it's people trivializing the woman's death not long after it happened with conspiracies and confirmation bias riddle mysteries for their own entertainment, instead of paying respects to a woman who passed likely due to her declining mental health, as hinted in some of her posts. The Sodder Children 1945 Christmas Eve, the Sodder family and nine of their ten children had their house in West Virginia destroyed via a big fire. During the fire, four of the children escaped with the parents, but the last five not only didn't escape, but their remains were never found. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we got a five-person disappearance now, motherfuckers. At least, that's what the family believes. Officially, they died. They did, But the family didn't think the children died in the fire. They think they escaped and ran off in the wilderness never to be found again. They even convert their burnt-down house into a memorial garden for lost children. To this day, their last surviving daughter and their grandchildren continue to bring up the case online and in media, which is some real dedication. Interestingly, the family also questioned some of the findings from officials about the fire. The fire was cited as being due to electrical wiring, but they questioned why the Christmas lights remained on if that was the case. Why exactly was the phone line cut? It wasn't burnt, it was cut. They actually found the person who did that, but they claimed that they didn't cause the fire. Police said that their children's bodies were burnt to ash, but as we should all know, burning bones is not really a thing. It takes a lot of heat to burn bones for a lot longer than that fire was going for. Later claims would come around the fire were started by people throwing firebombs at the house. And, so, and the supposed remains of their children that were found never existed. Apparently, one of apparently the police apparently the police officer who claimed this confessed to a minister, I think, and then a private investigator found this out. And instead, apparently there was a heart that was found and put into a metal box. But when they dug it up, it was determined to be made of beef liver. Obviously, even now we don't know what happened to those five kids. The youngest of which would be over 70 years old by now if they were alive, and we might never know. Paul the Octopus. Paul was a psychic octopus who used his cosmic foretelling knowledge to determine who would win games from the 2010 Football World Cup. Thank you everybody, that's enough of that. Okay, no, okay. Basically, they dropped this sort of thing down and Paul would eat only one of the two muscles. And Paul came out with a 60% accuracy rating, having guessed four correctly and two incorrectly for the 2008 UEFA Euro, and a 100% accuracy rating in the 2010 FIFA World Cup. Apparently there were a bunch of animals making predictions for this, of which most were wrong, so Paul was the lucky one. Or maybe not, because a different octopus that correctly predicted things was then eaten by the Japanese fishermen that found him. Good job. Cannibal Holocaust Piranha Scene Cannibal Holocaust is a 1980s found footage cannibal movie about a group of wankers who wander into Native American territory and stage a bunch of things for filming including massacres and burnings and stuff. And then they get brutally slaughtered by the natives for their wrongdoing, all of which is witnessed by a rescue team that find their remains and the cameras that filmed it all. The movie is infamous for its brutality, the fact that it was believed to be a snuff movie and the actors were genuinely killed, and that people nearly got charged for crimes over this. Also a lot of animal abuse. The film is like banned everywhere because of that. The scene in question here is a cut scene where a guy's leg is chopped off and thrown into a river to be eaten by piranhas. But the scene was never done because the camera malfunctioned, it wasn't safe, and the piranhas were too hard to control. One still survives from the attempt to shoot it, well two stills actually. Kyron Horman the biggest man in Oregon history. That is what some people use to describe the disappearance of seven-year-old Kyron Holman on Friday the 4th of June 2010. The case starts with Holman's stepmother, who's actually a suspect in the case, having been the last person who saw him. She claimed that she last saw him walking to class at school, but she failed two polygraph tests and divorced her husband soon after. Kyron was marked absent all day at school, which is somewhat incongruent with the idea that she saw him walk to class. However, there was a kid who claimed to see him at school too, which does support it. To add on to suspicions of his stepmother, his actual mother claimed that the woman hated Chiron, and blamed a lot of the marital problems between herself and his father on the child. 
All that said, the disappearance of the kid is still mysterious and remains unsolved. Judge Crater. Joseph Force Crater was a judge. He vanished during a political scandal. 1930, Crater went to eat dinner with a lawyer friend at Billy Haas' chop house, and after leaving and entering a taxi cab, he'd never be seen again. After this, obviously a big investigation happened. Three women that Crater was seeing at the time left, two leaving the country and one leaving life. And also, if you're over 50, you might be aware of what I mean when I say this is what the pulling a judge Crater is based on. Ogopogo. Hey, remember how America just really wanted their own Loch Ness monster? Canada wanted one too, so they made up the Ogopogo. It is believed to be a serpentine creature that lives within Okanagan Lake. Now, while Ogopogo was named in 1924 from an English song, the concept of a creature that lives within Okanagan Lake is much older, and originates with the Silks and Sequipam people under the name N Naitaka. I don't know if I pronounced any of those correctly. The Naitaka is a supernatural creature possessing equal parts power and malice, who demanded sacrifices in exchange for safe passage over the lake, often in the form of small animals. This view, however, is sometimes disputed, as it's claimed by some that the Silks people actually view the creature as a helpful spirit that protects the valley. Either way, Naitaka is way more interesting to me than this Ogopogo fuckerogo. The Kennedy Curse. The Kennedy Curse refers to how members of the Kennedy family die a lot. Here's a list. Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an ancient Greek ornery considered the oldest known example of an analog computer. Made of 36 bronze gears, it was made to track the moon and predict eclipses decades in advance. What's crazy about this device is that nothing of this complexity was seen until the 14th century. This fucker was built in the BC era! Making the Antikythera mechanism literally over a thousand years more advanced than anything else we know. Meaning there's probably a ton of conspiracies about ancient civilizations, or maybe aliens built it. A858. This is a subreddit and user who posted a bunch of nonsense strings of numbers and letters daily. These were codes, and as of today only a few have been decoded. One of these sort of indicated that the user was attempting an AMA, which didn't help answer any questions. A whole rabbit hole went down, but nothing really came of it in the end. And we more or less know that a company paid someone to make puzzles on Reddit and then decided to stop. That was that. Theories included being an ARG, a recruitment tool for security firms, a number station for international spies, and aliens. Wormholes. There you go, little bunny. That's right. You go, bro. Okay, well, I would have ended it there, but this is where this half of the iceberg ends, and I can't leave you on just that. A wormhole is a theoretical structure that can link two points in space that may or may not exist, but we have no evidence for it existing, despite the fact that it would not break any laws of physics, and thus is theoretically possible. You know, portals? They're all over fiction. Think those. They might be real, might be not. This script alone is longer than part two's, and I'm only halfway through this layer, and that scares me. Oh god, I really don't have a, an outro to this. I mean, this is really part one of part three, and uh, it's making me realize this is, this is gonna be like a 12 hour fucking super cut when I get to that. I, Jesus. Uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you could. I, I couldn't really fit as many jokes in this time. I felt like a lot of these subjects were ones that I couldn't make jokes for. Uh, but I tried, you know, so it wasn't just completely droll information spitting with no personality. Um, I'm, I realize that makes it sound like I might be like attacking other ice, other people who do through videos. No, that's not my intention at all. Um, I just, it's just the way I do things. Uh, so yeah. Uh, if you, thank you, the uh, fuck. Thank you to all my patrons, uh, scrolling by on screen right now. You guys are great. Uh, you guys can support my patron if you want. People who have not, that is. Obviously the people who are supporting my patreon are. Uh, and you can enter my, my patron only discord. Which is important, because that's exactly where I'm getting these quotes from that they want me to read out at the end of this video. Fuck's sake. <clears throat> this is gonna be a hard one. Sure. Alright, Yugi. Let's see if you can beat this card. Dragon Tales, Dragon Tales. It's almost time for Dragon Tales. Come along and take my hand. Let's all go to Dragon Land. Egyptian Jesus Kaiba! Gotta be real, not watching the Mario movie until they add Broly. Uh, that's very... Should I say that as Broly? I'm gonna say that as Broly. Gonna be real, Kakarot. Not watching the Mario movie until they add Broly! My name is... It's not as pleasant as you think. They don't treat you like a friend. They treat you like an item. You can't keep me in here, Megatron! Ah! I would personally like you to say some variation of this meme. Doesn't need to be this specific image, this is just the one I had on hand. It's Stephen King time! 
Mushroom Kingdom, here we come. That's probably reference to something. I'm so out of the loop, I don't, I don't understand. Iceberg, I thought this was Ohio. That's not ice. It's Mormon time. I'm in the drive through of Burger King. Can in please get a double Whopper Junior with onion rings making a meal so I can get a drink? I definitely said that correctly. All right, thank you all. Uh, I hope you all have a good one. I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'll try to get part two of part three done soon so you're not just left hanging on the rest of this like layer of the iceberg. Hey, they.